All right, in this video, we're going to be talking about the assumptions of linear regression. These are the things that must hold true in order for a regression to be legitimate. So we actually use the term assumptions not because we just assume these things are true for uh, any time we run a regression and then we can just forget them, uh, but rather because when we see a regression output, we assume that these are the things, these things have been checked out and, and, and they all hold true and therefore, therefore this is a legitimate regression and we can go ahead and interpret the results. If we were, if you were a very serious researcher, these are extremely important and these are things you're going to want to check out every time and there's a whole lot of tests to uh, validate these assumptions. But for business statistics, I really, I think it's more important to understand that these are the underlying assumptions of, of regression, be able to sort of, you know, know what they mean and, and maybe do a quick eyeball test and, and maybe one or two more tests, basically to understand what goes into, you know, sort of the, the, fun, the foundations of regression. So let's, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, so let's, let's proceed. Here you have the, the four assumptions. We're going to go into each of these in a little bit greater detail. But before we do that, um, I want to review just some of the terms of regression. Uh, of course, you know, when we're talking about linear regression, simple linear regression with one predictor variable, we're going to use, we're going to have a, an out, a predictor equation that looks like this, y equals mx plus b. m is the slope, and that is essentially just the change in y over the change in x, otherwise known as rise over run. Uh, we have a y-intercept over here, which is b. That's also called the constant in simple linear regression. And then the real term I wanted to define here is residuals. Residuals are the difference between an observed data point and the predicted point that we would get from our regression equation. So this line here, this red line, is our regression equation. That's this. Um, and you'll notice, in most cases, our actual observed data doesn't actually land exactly on the line. The, the line is a best fit through our data. And the residuals are where we have a difference between the observed and what would be predicted by our regression equation. If you remember, actually, the way to get this equation, you're, you, this equation is the equation that results in the smallest sum of the square of the residuals. That's what linear regression is. It's, it's a it's least sum of squares. It's, it's the, the, the way you get this equation is you figure out what is the equation that results in the smallest sum of the squares of all these residuals. All right, so I, just, I really wanted to define again this term residuals. Let's talk about the, these regression assumptions and get to the first one, linearity. Oh, want to point out, I got a little bit carried away uh, when I was making these drawings, these examples, and, and, and did some kind of awesome drawing. And you can see a couple examples down here. I want to ask you as we go through these slides not to be distracted by my really cool drawings because they are pretty elaborate. Anyhow, this is the linearity assumption. Obviously, and we've talked about this already, you really shouldn't be doing regression uh, on a linear regression on data that is not linear. That sort of, the whole point is, is that we, we should be dealing with linear uh, data and therefore putting a best fit line, line again, through that data. If it's not linear, you can't put a line through it and have it make sense. So that's the two examples here. We can put a, a line through this, sure, best fit line right there. You could put a line through this, but it, it's no good. It wouldn't give you accurate predictions because this is not linear data. It would look the same if it was an inverted U or all sorts of other possibilities. So first assumption, linearity, the data must be basically linear. This is a trickier one, assumption number two, independence of errors. Okay, over here, we have data that's essentially a cloud. Now it's a linear looking cloud, but you know, it's, it's just sort of randomly dropped around our, you know, our predictor line that we assigned. Over here, now, notice this. For, be, ignore my cool drawings. Notice this. Uh, this is, you know, if we put a line, this red line, through this data 
you know, it's actually, it's, it's linear, sort of. But what we have is the residuals. The errors follow a pattern. They, they, they start out, you could say they start out close to, to, to the center and then they get farther and farther away up until a point and then they come back. And that's because they're, you could say the, the, the data points, the, the residuals are influencing each other. So, you know, here we've got little residual, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, big residual, smaller, 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 smaller. Then it gets negative residuals, small negative residual, larger negative residual as we go up the line. Uh, what this says is that there's, there's no, the, the, these errors are not independent. They have to, the, the next one has to do with the previous one. Um, and so we can't have that. Uh, we, you know, we, we have to have basically random errors. Uh, as, as we go, you know, according to our x values. So that's the second assumption, that the errors are independent. If they're not independent, you really, you know, you may, may have to make an adjustment because this is not, um, the data as it is currently constructed will not be a good candidate for regression. You'll get, your predictions won't be accurate. This one has a very tricky name, but it actually isn't that confusing. It's, the, the assumption is that you ha have data that is homoscedastic. I pretty much said that right. Um, what that means is as you go up, there's no trend in, as you go up the X, you know, as, we, we, as X gets larger or smaller, there's no trend in the size of the residuals. This is kind of like um, independence of errors. There's no trend in terms of, with independence of errors, we have trends with residuals, though it's, it, they don't necessarily get larger or smaller on the whole. When we talk about heteroscedastic data, which we don't want, there is a trend in the size of the residuals. It could be, they could be trending larger as X gets larger, or they could be trending, we could have a, this, it, you know, this could be the exact opposite. They could be getting smaller, you know, start out big residuals getting smaller as X gets larger. It usually, um, it means the data is generally going to look like a cone of one, one sort or another, either, you know, a funnel going right or a funnel going left. Uh, but we don't want that. Um, and you can sort of eyeball the data and say, does it look like, you know, the errors are getting, does it look like our data points are getting more spread out? In other words, larger residuals as we go farther or, you know, to, to in one direction or another? If so, that's bad. We might need to do a transformation in order to actually be able to run an accurate regression. This slide, I've got another, I've got another um, uh, slide to explain this. This is a test for homoscedasticity. Like I said, you can sort of eyeball the data and maybe say, okay, it looks like um, it looks like our data is heteroscedastic. Um, but we can also run a. We can also look at the data. We can plot the residuals or the square of the residuals versus the x value and what we should see is if we you know if we square the residuals or take the absolute value of the residuals they should basic there should basically be a slope of zero meaning no matter how large our x value is we can expect a fairly you know a consistent or you know a random i should say uh, a fairly random distribution. Some of the, the residuals are going to be positive, some of them are going to be negative. You know, they're all going to be, uh, some of them are going to be larger or smaller, but it's not going to make a difference in terms of, you know, what our x value is in terms of whether we're getting larger or smaller or positive or negative residuals. On the other hand, here we have a heteroscedastic data. Um, heteroscedastic. Heteroscedastic. See, I'm... I'm struggling here. <laughs> as you see, the square of our residuals gets larger and larger as our x values go up. So we want, so this would be heteroscedastic, um, just kind of like this, where our, our, our residuals get larger as our x values go up, whereas our homoscedastic data on the left, um, the residuals, whoops, sorry, the residuals don't follow a trend in terms of our x value. Homoscedastic. Okay, I'm getting this. Assumption number four. See how quickly we're getting through these? And this is where my, my drawings get really, really cool, as you can see. This is another kind of tricky one. This is that there, the assumption number four is that there is normality of error distribution. What that means is that at any given point in, our, in terms of our x values, 
we would expect the actual da data points to be normally distributed around that, that point in terms of their distance from our predicted value. So our actual observations would be normally distributed around our prediction line in terms of how far away they are from that line. In other words, we would expect to see observations that are mostly clustered around the line. You know, so our, our, our observed values would be mostly pretty close to our predicted value with a few outliers. This is just like a normal curve. You know, you, you see a normal curve. We've got more data points towards the middle and fewer on the edges. That's what we're hoping to see in terms of our residuals, essentially. We're, we're expecting to see fewer big residuals, positive or negative, and more that are cl clustered around um, you know, small, smaller residuals, positive and negative. And an even distribution, both positive and negative residuals, at any point on the x line. Over here, you can see we have an even distribution, positive and negative. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways that we could have non-normal error distribution. But here we've got observed values that are evenly distributed, positive and negative, but we don't have any middle ground. You know, we actually, we don't have anything in here. We have a whole bunch that are big and a whole bunch that are small. That would, I mean, it, that, that distribution is going to look something like this. think. Um, most, most of the data is either clustered around the predict, you know, most of the residuals are either very small, positive and negative, or very large, positive and negative. That is not normal. That's like, a, yeah, whatever that is. Waves. I don't know. Um, but there's a lot of different ways you could have non-normal data, but the assumption is that your error distribution is going to be normal at any point on X. So that's why I drew this little normal curve showing, yeah, we have a couple outliers here and here, but mostly our data is kind of clustered around here, or our residuals are clustered around here. So there you have it.